And Arconia invited me to be one of the principal investigators on this device. And this is what we did. It was for this green and violet combination laser that I have right here. And this was for chronic neck and shoulder pain. And we'll get into the details on this a little bit more, but I want to start with some of the results that we saw during our clinical trials. <clears throat> we were comparing our results to previous studies with the red and violet combination and with red only. And what we saw is that each time that you add in another true laser wavelength, not an LED, sometimes people will cut corners and do one that's a laser and one that's an LED. We're using two true collimated coherent lasers that each time we upped it, that we got better results. So for example, when we did the green and violet, the average duration of pain in the patients that we saw in the clinical trials between my office, Dr. Comey's office, and Dr. Robert Silverman's office was 89 months of pain. After a single 13-minute session, doing half of that time on one side, half on the other time, we saw an average percentage pain relief of 52% immediately after that treatment. That is literally, we would measure it one minute later, within one to five minutes later. Then we had patients do follow-ups at 24 hours and 48 hours, and what we saw also was that their pain improved an additional 65% improvement in their pain from the start of this single session to even two days later. And the improvement in range of motion was 32% on average in these uh, trials. And you can see with red only, it was 14%. Red and violet was 29. Green and violet was 32%. Look at that pain drop, you know, 43 with red only, 50% with red and violet, and 65% with green and violet. So there's really something big there with these results we were getting. And it actually was such a big result that it concerned me so much because I thought, hey, is there something that... I'm either doing wrong in the study or that patients are, you know, are, is there some type of a placebo effect going on here? Because these were wild at how big these drops were. And again, I was an experienced laser practitioner for a long time, but this is on an even bigger level to where I even contacted Travis Sammons, who was running the clinical trials for us. I said, Hey, Travis, I'm concerned that my results may be out of what the norm is in the other two uh, locations. And he told me, don't worry about it, man. They're getting the same kind of result. And these are also long-term laser practitioners practitioners as well, but there's something that combination of the violet and the green laser that takes these results to a whole other level. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. I do want to let you know about a couple of these patients that I had in the clinical trial that followed up with me with these long-term results. So one of the subjects, she was a female who was a college volleyball player and now a volleyball coach. For six years, she had a chronic pain in her shoulder that affected her ability to play in college and affected her ability to coach. She'd had multiple sessions of PT, you know, cortisone injections, et cetera. We did that one 13 minute session and she had full range of motion at the end of it. And it's now been many months since we did the clinical trials and she still has full range of motion and she's still pain-free. Another patient who was in the clinical trials, he had played division one college football back in the eighties, suffered from chronic shoulder pain. He could only bring it up to about 110 degrees in abduction. And he had severe pain, like a seven to eight pain just every day with it. Did the one 13-minute session. I was not expecting this re reaction, but at the end of 13 minutes, and this is doing no soft tissue treatment, no adjustments, nothing, just the laser while we're doing some passive range of motion, he went up to 170 degrees of pain, uh, of range of motion, and his pain was down to about barely there too. He has maintained that range of motion, and uh, he's also kept his pain low, and that's been many, many months since we've done the clinical trials. So these are some of the cool things that we saw. So Let's get into how does this actually happen? Because when you're looking at lasers, you got to think about, well, which wavelength or device is the best. And each wavelength affects the electron transport chain in the mitochondria, these protein complexes differently. And it produces what are called wavelength specific, unique photochemical effects that you can only get with a particular wavelength. And each of these wavelengths has a specific photon energy, which is called an electron volt. And certain electron volts, certain minimum thresholds are required to trigger specific reactions at different processes in the electron transport chain. So just to let you know, what I'm going to talk about is based on research. And this is a great book for you to check out if you're into laser therapy, laser phototherapy by Turner and Hode. There's over 135 pages of research references, hundreds of studies that are on there. The bulk of the studies cited are below 500 milliwatts, which is class two or class three, because that's what most of the research is on. So always, whenever you're learning about lasers, fact check who's ever talking about it, including me. 
but do it in the legitimate way, not the Facebook fact checker way. Go in here and read these studies, go into PubMed and read the studies and look for the quality studies, the ones that are uh, level one randomized placebo controlled studies, <clears throat> because there's a lot of unsupported opinion out there that is stated as if it were fact. So you want to look to see what is the specific wavelength and specific power for the FDA clearances. Do these devices just claim equivalency to another device that has totally different powers and wavelengths? Because the FDA can approve something because they consider, oh, laser is the same stuff, even if you have a different wavelength and different uh, uh, different parameters on there. They're not looking to see, does it get the same result? Just can we clear it as being safe? You also want to check to see if there are level one RCT studies on there to support the claims. And for any manufacturer, check their references on their sites, because what you'll find, many will list references to studies on completely different product parameters that they say don't work in their marketing, yet they'll use them as a reference to support their devices that are totally different. We see this a lot to where other manufacturers will come out and say that Arconia lasers don't work, uh, they're too low power, et cetera. Yet then on their sites, they're citing all of our research and trying to say it is uh, supporting their device. So just be aware of those things. I also encourage you to take a look at this study, low-level laser therapy in Russia. The USSR was far ahead of us when it came to laser research. And uh, this is a great paper to read. A few of the key points they found is that too much power a dose can lead to a decreased or opposite effect, especially long-term effects. Pulsing lasers more effective than continuous wave. And a key thing here is that <clears throat> combining lasers and LEDs will lead to a diminished effect from the laser due to scattering inhibition triggered by the non-coherent light. So the reason I mentioned this is because there's a lot of devices out there, like I said earlier, that will try to go on the cheap and combine a true laser with LEDs and say, hey, this is just as good as, say, like the GVL that has two actual true coherent lasers. Well, going clear back to the Russians in the 60s, they already showed that's not the case because the LED non-coherent light will create a scatter effect with the true laser and you'll get a diminished result on there. So it's something to think about. So let's get back to now, how did this GVL create those results that you saw in the study chart there? and in the patients that I talked about. And since I've added it in, I'm using it on all of my patients. I actually use a combination of green, violet, and red lasers on almost every patient. And you'll see why in just a little bit. What you have to think about is when we get a laser on a patient, so say when I get this laser on, on me here and I've got this green and violet laser, um, what's happening while it's there? Well, these are non-thermal lasers, so patients don't feel any heat. But what they're getting is they're getting this photon energy being absorbed by the mitochondria. The mitochondria are responsible for 90% of the ATP our body needs to function and has a pivotal role in cell life and cell death. And mitochondrial dysfunction is common in autoimmune diseases, aging, neurodegeneration, long COVID, and many more ailments. Now, what's important is that in the past, we thought that, oh, you had to put the laser directly on a site and it only has an impact here. But we see is that there's this abscopal or global effect that occurs, especially with the visible lasers. For example, as I have this laser here on my neck or any part of the body, there's free floating mitochondria in the bloodstream that are going to absorb the photon energy and disperse it throughout the body. This allows photon energy to affect even sites far away from the application site. And additionally, <clears throat> different wavelengths of laser light can trigger biophotonic emissions from cells. And we'll get into that a little bit more. These will travel through the microtubules, through basically the cytoskeleton of the cells and of the, uh, the neural networks, and even the myelin sheaths. They'll act like a fiber optic laser network. And I'll show you the studies on that. <clears throat> 